With Tears of the Kingdom now actually on the horizon with a release date next year, what better time to look back at Breath of the Wild's world and its secrets? Zelda games are deliberately ambiguous with their storytelling. The lore of the series is intricate and fascinating, but rarely is it explicitly told or shown to the player. Instead, a lot of the world building comes from piecing together little secrets and hints, and nowhere is this more important than in Breath of the Wild. Hyrule is ruined, but the story of the kingdom's fall happens a century before Link's adventure, so the details of this catastrophe are discovered only through memory cutscenes, item descriptions, some character dialogue, and the world itself. Let's have a look back at Breath of the Wild, and cover a hundred little secrets that help us piece together the game's lore and Hyrule's backstory. By the time of Breath of the Wild, tens of thousands of years after any other Zelda game, there appears to have been a resurgence of faith in the goddess Hylia. However, the original three golden goddesses haven't been forgotten. We can see the symbols of Din, Nehru, and Faror carved into the stone floor of the three small buildings outside of the Temple of Time. This is also the case with the symbol of the Triforce on the Temple of Time, which also features the Golden Goddess's emblems on their respective pieces. Though goddess statues are found in every town, faith in Hylia differs between the races. The Gerudo apparently once worshipped Hylia, but their belief faded over time, and their goddess statue sits forgotten in a back alley. The Horned Statue is found just outside of Hateno Village, and will swap Link's heart containers and stamina vessels for a price. The statue explains that it was once a dealer in life and power, but fell out of favour with the goddess Hylia, who imprisoned it within the statue. The Knight's Claymore, a two-handed sword apparently only used by the most confident of Hyrule Castle's knights, has a Triforce symbol just below the blade, and an inscription that reads, Hyrule Kingdom, Power, Wisdom, Courage. Compared to other games, there isn't a huge amount of Triforce symbolism in Breath of the Wild, but clearly its importance wasn't forgotten by the kingdom. The Great Plateau is a strange place. It's raised high above its surroundings, with huge stone walls built into its sides by Hylians. It's home to the ruined Temple of Time, which is strange enough considering how far the plateau is from Castletown, but what's even stranger is that it isn't far from Castletown at all. The plateau actually hides the ruins of Ocarina of Time's Castletown. We can see the central fountain, and even the gate that used to lead to Hyrule Castle. Although why the ruins of Castletown are found here is a mystery. On the ruined walls of the Great Plateau and the Castletown Fountain, plaques read, On this day, the King of Hyrule opened this structure to the public. Hylian Retrievers can be found at stables. The Hyrule Compendium mentions that it's said that all Hylian Retrievers are descendants of a dog once owned by a King of Hyrule. The Old Man on the Great Plateau, who serves as a guide to Link when he awakens from the Shrine of Resurrection, is of course revealed to be the spirit of King Rome. There are a few hints to his secret before it's revealed. The music that plays when he paraglides down to meet Link is a sped up version of the classic Hyrule Castle theme. and the old man carries with him a lantern on a stick, just like the Poes, which are spirits of the dead. The old man can be found at the highest peak on the Great Plateau, Mount Hylia, standing next to a strange collection of rocks. The file name for this object suggests that this rock is his tombstone, and this is backed up by creating a champion, which suggests that the Sheikah buried him here after he died during the Calamity. Supporting this is the fact that the graveyard outside Kakariko Village is filled with these rocks, suggesting that this is how the Sheikah bury their dead. Hidden in a secret room in the castle library is King Rome's journal, 
where Zelda's father laid out his thoughts and feelings mainly concerning his relationship with his daughter. He mentions how the looming threat of the calamity leads him to act as a king, not a father, when forcing Zelda to focus on awakening her latent powers instead of researching ancient technology. In the final entry, Rome notes a change of heart, that if Zelda returns from the Spring of Wisdom again unsuccessful in unlocking her power, he won't scold her, and will instead allow her to choose her own path, which is a heartbreaking detail considering Zelda never returned to her father. The calamity struck just after she prayed at the Spring of Wisdom. The bookshelves in Hyrule Castle Library are organised by a sorting system. Plaques on the top have Hylian text which, when translated, give us what floor of the library we're on, either A for ground floor or B for first floor, then the letter the book's titles begin with. There's a secret passageway leading into the library from the east side of the castle, appropriately named the East Passage. There's a minecart through a cave, a talus boss fight, then a steep shaft that leads up to the secret entrance to the castle library. Unlike most others, we actually know why this passageway exists. Ami at the Wetland Stable notes that the East Passage was built as an escape route for the royal family. Perhaps it saw some use during the Calamity a hundred years ago. The lockup below Hyrule Castle is a menagerie of Ganon's creatures. Cages keep Lazalfos and Moblins imprisoned in the bowels of the fortress. There's even a Stalnox in a large chamber at the back, and it's from here that we can get an idea of what the lockup was for. A tablet behind the Stalnox reads, Strike down the giant foe to become recognised as a knight of the kingdom. There's a broken platform that was presumably used to lower the Stalnox into the chamber, so perhaps the lockup was built to contain monsters for use in training Hyrule's military, with the strongest among them able to take on a Stalnox and earn the rank of knight. For the past century, the abandoned ruin of Hyrule Castle has been raided by the bravest, or stupidest, treasure hunters. Parsi at the Riverland Stable claims that she used to visit it to search for Royal Guard's equipment in the past when the castle wasn't as dangerous, and Molo at the Woodland Stable wonders if he should try to risk it, but that no one he knows who has gone there has come back, probably just because they're too busy being rich. Akala Citadel is impossible to miss, a gigantic stone fortress built on top of, and into, a high cliff. It's a truly formidable castle, sporting cannons and multiple layers of defence, and, according to Nell, is where the Hyrulean army made their last stand against the Calamity. The item description for Luminous Stones notes that many believe them to house the souls of the dead due to the eerie colour they glow at night, which is probably true. They glow just like the spirits of the Champions and King Rome. And if that is true, then it makes Zora's Domain pretty disturbing, as it's built out of massive quantities of Luminous Stone, and glows at night. The Zora set can be obtained around Zora's Domain, and bestows Link with the abilities of a Zora, the tunic allows him to swim up waterfalls, the helm unlocks a spin attack, and the trousers increase swimming speed. Interestingly, the helm is apparently crafted using dragon scales. Scales are often given to Link to unlock Zora-like abilities in the water, like the silver and gold scales in Ocarina of Time, or the water dragon scale in Skyward Sword, which also unlocks a spin attack, so it's not surprising that Breath of the Wild's Zora armour seems to work the same way. Scattered around Zora's domain are ten carved stone monuments, immortalising stories from the tribe's history. According to one, King Dorifan commissioned the monuments from a gifted stonemason, giving him a huge amount of notes to work with. The stonemason carved out seven monuments from the king's notes, then added three more. One to celebrate the king's own victories, one for Prince Sidon, and one for himself. He notes that as long as he remembers to sign the monuments, his name will be remembered in history forever. He didn't do this, so his name is forgotten. Zora Monument 2 explains the history of the East Reservoir Lake, where Varuta is found. Apparently, every decade the Lanayru region suffers unusually heavy rainfall and flooding, and the Zora had to ask for aid from the King of Hyrule, resulting in a collaborative effort building the reservoir to contain the floods. 
Monument 7 is very worn, but we can still read the story. Over a hundred years ago, Link saved Zora's domain by slaying the Lynel on Ploymus Mountain, a story also described in Mipha's diary. Addendum 2 tells us of a time when Hateno Bay was terrorised by a gigantic Octorok. Prince Sidon travelled south to slay the beast, and, after being swallowed whole, cut his way out from inside. Addendum 1 states that a hundred years after King Dorifan ascended to the Zora throne, sometime after the Great Calamity, a stray guardian wandered into their domain. It seemed unstoppable, its hull invulnerable to the Zora's sharpest spears. Hope seemed lost, until the king himself walked out to face the Sheikah machine. He lifted the guardian and hurled it into a ravine, shattering it, and his kingdom was saved. It's a great little backstory for the king, and just at the foot of the Lineru Tower, in a ravine just outside Zora's domain, we can find the broken remains of a guardian, perhaps the very same one defeated by the king. When it rains in Hateno village, Karin heads into the chief's house and opens a storybook. It's drawn in a style very similar to that of the Wind Waker's introduction cutscene, and shows a crowned man in a blue shirt riding a horse towards Hyrule Castle. The text translates to, Once upon a time there lived a prince. One day on his way to the castle, something strange happened. Who knows if this story is just a story, or if it's based on an event that really happened. At the climax of the Great Calamity a hundred years ago, Zelda journeyed to Hyrule Castle, alone, to face the darkness. We know that she remained here for a century, keeping the beast sealed, but where actually is she? It seems the answer is that the princess was eaten by Ganon, and remained inside him for a hundred years. When she speaks to Link, her voice comes from inside Ganon's cocoon, and she appears to burst out of Dark Beast Ganon at the end of the battle. Manny in her Taino village refers to Zelda as the princess who got swallowed up by the Calamity, and Robbie's memoirs state that, a hundred years ago, Calamity Ganon had already swallowed Princess Zelda. When Link finally reaches the sanctum of Hyrule Castle to face Ganon, he's met with a horrific, writhing cocoon. The Calamity tears itself free and reveals that it's a chaotic splicing of malice and various Sheikah parts. Its Hyrule Compendium entry notes an interesting detail. Apparently, since Link awoke from the Shrine of Resurrection, it's been trying to build itself a new physical form, but was interrupted and forced to confront the hero while incomplete. Rock salt can be found all across Hyrule, and curiously, its item description mentions that it is crystallised salt from the ancient sea. We don't know what ancient sea this refers to. As the salt can be found everywhere, the obvious candidate would be the Wind Waker's Great Sea, but it's left a mystery. Many item descriptions note that gemstones can harness the power of the elements. Sapphire contains the power of ice and can keep Link cool, Topaz has the power of electricity and can guard Link from lightning, Rubies are linked with fire and keep Link warm, and so on. Throughout his quest, Link can find many elemental weapons. Arrows, swords, and spears imbued with the power of fire, ice, or lightning to use against Ganon's forces. The weapon's Hyrule Compendium entries give us a little more information on how they were made. Frost weapons were made by smelting ore and ancient ice found in the permafrost of the Hebra Mountains. Thunder weapons forged by the Hyrulean royal family using lightning from the Hyrule Hills and Thundra Plateau. And fire weapons forged in the fires of Death Mountain by Goron smiths and unknown magicians in an ancient age. Just like in The Wind Waker, Link can pick up enemy weapons to use for himself. Moblins and Bokoblins use primitive clubs and spears made from wood, rope, and animal bones, but Lizalfos and Lynels apparently have, or had, the technology required to forge their own metal equipment. The descriptions note that Lizalfos gear is poorly made, but Lynel tools are much sturdier. Killing monsters rewards Link with all sorts of gruesome treasures. Guts, toenails, tails, and eyeballs. 
Interestingly, the descriptions for almost all of the monster guts mention how they continue to quiver even after the creature they belong to has died, and that this is what makes them useful when cooking. We learn from cursed skull enemies that malice can keep monsters alive even when it should be impossible. So perhaps even when their bodies are destroyed, some parts of Ganon's minions can't die, and their organs continue to pulse and writhe. However, we do know that once defeated, the spirits of Ganon's monsters wander the land aimlessly, without a body, until their master's power surges with a blood moon and renews their flesh. Kilton will sell Link Monster Extract, mysterious vials full of a purple liquid. It's more than likely that this extract is a form of pure malice, the energy of Calamity Ganon. It's extracted from monsters, it's bright purple in colour, and the liquid moves by itself inside the vial. Introduced in Master Mode, Golden Enemies are a step above even the powerful Silver class. Their Hyrule Compendium entries note that they were once Silver Enemies, but were made stronger after having been struck by lightning. Many higher level monster weapons are reinforced with a material known as Dragon Bone, fossilised remains used to add strength and weight to crude clubs and spears. It's never explicitly stated where enemies get this Dragon Bone, or to which dragons the bones belonged, but it's possible that the giant skeletons that litter areas of Hyrule like the Gerudo Desert were known as dragons, and this is where enemies collect materials for their weapons. There's an area near Rito village village called Dragonbone Mire. But separate from these giant remains are dragons Dinral, Nadra, and Farosh, beings closely connected to the goddesses. They serve the sacred springs of power, wisdom, and courage. Their Hyrule Compendium entry strengthens the idea that they're not typical fauna, but something more divine. They're described as elemental spirits that have taken on the forms of dragons. The dueling peaks mark the entrance to the Nekluda region, two huge mountains leaning into one another. According to Shea at the Lakeside Stable, the dueling peaks were once a single mountain, but it was split in two by a dragon god long ago. It appears that the dragons can't be seen by most adult Hylians. Shea mentions that some people claim to have seen the shadow of a large creature over Lake Floria. Ron claims that in order to come face to face with one, you need the blessing of the goddess Hylia, and the rumour mill suggests that most eyewitness accounts of dragons come from children. The same is true for the Koroks. The first one Link finds will be surprised that Hylian can see him, and Hestu claims that nobody has been able to see him for a century. It's likely that in order to see spirits like dragons and Koroks, one needs to be pure of heart, explaining why children seem to be able to see them. Breath of the Wild, rather infamously, has 900 hidden Koroks across Hyrule, finding each of which rewards Link with a Korok seed, which we learn from Hestu are the beads used in his magical maracas. We're not explicitly told what they actually are, only that they have a distinct smell, but it's made clear after collecting them all. Hestu rewards Link with Hestu's gift, an unusually shaped object that apparently smells pretty bad. Hestu's gift is similar to a Kin no Unko, or Golden Poo, a symbol of good luck in Japan. And the game's director, Hidemaru Fujibayashi, confirmed in an interview that, yep, throughout Link's entire adventure, he's been collecting Korok Poo. The trunks of the Lost Woods trees are twisted into faces, and their gaping mouths occasionally hide treasure. According to Maka, these trees are known as Ogre Trees, or in the Japanese version, Oni Trees. The Forest Dweller's equipment is a set of gear apparently carved from the wood of trees that only grow in the Korok Forest. Perhaps they're carved from Ogre Trees. Interestingly, the item descriptions note that the equipment was made by Koroks for Hylians, with the sword apparently once used to clear vines and forged paths through forests. Considering that, in a way, the Koroks are the forest, creating tools for Hylians to hack through their homeland seems strange, but it's an interesting bit of lore. At the Woodland Stable, Link can find Shamei, a young girl who talks about a land in the sky. This is most likely a nod to Skyloft and the floating islands of Skyward Sword, especially considering the mention of riding a really big bird, 
but it takes on a new meaning now with Tears of the Kingdom. The dragon bones aren't the only colossal fossils. There are also the three leviathans. Two of these line up almost exactly with giant creatures from Hyrule's history. The Eldin Leviathan matches with Levias from Skyward Sword, and the Gerudo Leviathan sports tiny wings on its back, matching with the Windfish from Link's Awakening. The third fossil, however, is a mystery. In A Link to the Past, Zelda and Sahasrila can speak to Link telepathically, and it's mentioned in Ocarina of Time that Hylians have long ears so that they can listen to the gods. Yonobo claims that he didn't know Hylians could do things like telepathy nowadays, but considering how Zelda can communicate with Link from Hyrule Castle, it seems that this ability hasn't been lost, just forgotten. Just south of Hyrule Castle are the Ranch Ruins, the remains of a farmstead destroyed a century ago by Ganon. The ruins match up exactly with Ocarina of Time's Lon Lon Ranch, even down to the buildings outside of the racetrack and the silo behind it. And all the way over in Hateno Village, Link can buy bottles of milk. But not just any milk, Lon Lon milk, like that from Lon Lon Ranch in Ocarina of Time. According to the item description, the milk actually comes from Hateno Village cows and goats, but it's possible that the bottles are leftovers from the ruined ranch. It seems that the ability to slow down time when aiming and performing flurry rushes isn't just a gameplay mechanic, but an actual ability Link has in-universe. Tabor at the flight range mentions that when watching Link shoot, it was as if time slowed around him, and Daruk's training journal notes that Link once said he felt like time slowed when he focused. Throughout the entire Zelda series, Link rarely has much of a family. An uncle in A Link to the Past, a grandma and a sister in The Wind Waker, an unseen mother in Ocarina of Time. We get a tiny bit of information on Link's father in Breath of the Wild. In a memory, Zelda mentions that his father was a Hylian knight. Another interesting detail is revealed by Zelda's diary. For the most part, Link is silent. He's not mute, we can see that he does speak with chat options, but in all of the memories he doesn't say a word. But the princess's diary reveals that Link chooses to stay silent, in order to deal with the huge burden of being the hero. Also noted is a dream she had. A little while before she visits the Spring of Wisdom, she dreamed that she was in a place consumed by darkness, where a lone woman gazed at her, haloed by blinding light. Zelda sensed that this woman was not of this world, and she didn't know if she was a goddess, but she was beautiful. It's possible that this woman was a manifestation of the goddess Hylia, trying to communicate with her descendant through dreams. Fee is the spirit of the Master Sword introduced in Skyward Sword. At the end of the game, she begins a sleep without end inside the sword, explaining her absence throughout the Zelda timeline that follows on from the game. However, she's still within the sword by the time of Breath of the Wild. Fee speaks to Zelda after Link falls defending Fort Hateno. There's a giant circular hole in Hebra Peak, and the stone inside this missing chunk is a strange, smooth texture, like it's been fused together. It's possible that this was the result of a Divine Beast's laser beam, perhaps during the battle against Ganon 10,000 years ago. Monkton at the Snowfield Stable tells the story of how he lost two childhood friends. One, he dared to enter the mysterious Lome Labyrinth to the north, and the other fell into Tanagar Canyon near the Forgotten Temple. He mentions that these childhood friends were horses, and even in his old age, he still remembers them. Stables each feature a huge wooden horse head on top of the main tent, which allows travellers to see the signs of civilization from far away. Interestingly, the design of the horse head matches the face of Melania, the horse god, so perhaps there were religious reasons for building the stables with this design. The springs of power, wisdom, and courage all match almost exactly with the sky view and earth springs from Skyward Sword, suggesting that two of them are these very same locations, just thousands of years later. We can find other examples of stonework dating back to the time of Skyward Sword too, like the ancient columns near Rito Village and the Lineru Promenade, which both feature the leaf symbol found in the Skyview Temple, and depictions of loft wings like those found in Sky Keep. The Forgotten Temple could be the ruins of Skyward Sword's Sealed Temple, 
Although the old man suggests that the Temple of Time and the Great Plateau was the birthplace of the Kingdom of Hyrule, the Forgotten Temple is home to what is apparently the oldest goddess statue. This crumbling ruin features ancient Hylian architecture, such as loft wing designs, and the area in which the goddess statue stands matches the back of the sealed temple once Skyloft's goddess statue returns to the surface. We can spot the exact same walls, and even the sealed temple's pillars appear to have survived the millennia. Another landmark from Hyrule's history is found at Lake Hylia, the forgotten remains of Twilight Princess's Great Bridge. The Flight Range is where Rivali trained at aerial combat, found just northwest of Rito Village. Rivali's diary mentions that the Flight Range was built specifically for Rivali as a reward for winning yet another archery competition before the Calamity. The Paraglider, given to Link by King Rome, is one of the game's most important items, but we don't know much about it or how it came into the King's possession. We can guess who made it though. It features the symbol of the Rito tribe. It makes sense for a race of flying creatures to build a device that lets wingless beings soar through the sky like they do. Across Hyrule, Link can find small campsites set up by other travellers. Some are still present at their camps, but many of the sites are now abandoned. Empty tents and extinguished fires are all that remains. These campsites show us that some travellers dared to explore even the most remote, dangerous places in the kingdom, like the North Lome Labyrinth. Dodongos and the other great beasts of Death Mountain appear to be extinct by the time of Breath of the Wild, but we can see evidence that they did exist at some point. There are colossal footprints on the volcano's rocky slopes. Goron City sits in the shadow of a huge carved mountain, like a Goron Mount Rushmore. It depicts Daruk, as you'd expect, but also a weird group of other Gorons. Gorkoron from Twilight Princess, and Darmani and the Goron Elder's son from Majora's Mask. In the Taobab grasslands, just east of the Gerudo Desert, Link can find and tame a giant horse, far larger than any of its kin, with a black coat and a burning orange mane. Its compendium entry suggests that it is the last of its kind, and that it has an extremely wild temperament. It's possible that this is a descendant of Ganondorf's horse from Ocarina of Time, another huge stallion with black fur and an orange mane, presumably native to the Gerudo region. The Noble Canteen in Gerudo Town is famous for specialities like the Noble Pursuit, where Gerudo women come to have one or two drinks, just to wet the whistle. It seems their beverages aren't only enjoyed by the Gerudo, though. Cloyne in Luralin Village sits on the floor enjoying a few bottles marked clearly with the Gerudo symbol, the same bottles drank in the Noble Canteen. The seven Gerudo heroines are massive statues involved in a shrine quest. Their origin and purpose is unknown, and strangely, an eighth heroine can be found all the way up in the Gerudo Highlands, alone. Even more mysterious is the fact that Gerudo text on each heroine statue translates to the Seven Sages, referring to the sacred group of chosen individuals that appear in multiple games in the series. If these seven are depictions of the Seven Sages, then who's the eighth? The Gerudo are a race of warrior women, to whom a male is born only once a century. This man is destined to become their king, like we saw with Ganondorf in Ocarina of Time. However, creating a champion notes that there has been no male Gerudo leader since Ganondorf, so it seems that for tens of thousands of years, the Gerudo have ignored tradition, perhaps out of shame for the Calamity being one of their own. It's possible that the Gerudo take their name from an ancient species of desert flower, or perhaps they simply once referred to themselves as metaphorical flowers. Many stone plaques throughout Gerudo areas mention this. For example, Riju's throne reads, Gerudo, a resilient desert flower facing the sun's gaze. Gerudo grows, brilliant, while others fade. In the eastern Gerudo Desert, Link can find a set of half-buried ruins called the Arbiter's Grounds, obviously a callback to the dungeon from Twilight Princess. Though the ruins don't match up well, perhaps this is all that remains of the Execution Grounds. Zelda's mother died when the princess was only six, so we never see Hyrule's queen, 
but she's an important part of the story, not just for Zelda, but for the Gerudo champion Urbosa too. Both her diary and her champion's ballad memory show that the two had a very close friendship, which explains why Urbosa becomes so protective of Zelda. Link eventually tracks the Yiga clan down to their hideout to the north of the Gerudo Desert. They've set up in the ruins of an ancient temple, but it wasn't built by the Yiga or even the Sheikah. It's clearly Gerudo in origin, with statues of the seven heroines guarding the entrance. When Yiga foot soldiers fight, they'll occasionally project a ring of symbols around themselves, which matches the Kujin, or nine syllable seals, which you might have seen used in anime like Naruto. Interestingly, Monk Mazkoshia also uses this technique, showing that the Yiga fight using the same abilities as the powerful ancient Shika monks. The ancient tapestry depicts the war against Calamity Ganon 10,000 years ago, and how the Shika's technological prowess was used against it. Obviously, it shows Link and Zelda backed up by the four divine beasts and an army of guardians, but also Shika monks. So, the battle against the Last Calamity wasn't fought just by machines, but the Sheikah themselves. We've seen just how powerful a single monk can be with the fight against Monk Mazkoshia, but here we see dozens of them fighting together against the darkness. The seven monks at the end of the Trial of the Sword perform the same poses as Ocarina of Time sages, suggesting that they carry out a similar purpose. Completing a shrine rewards Link with a spirit orb. But what actually are they? Well, considering that they're called spirit orbs and are given to Link by the monks just before they fade away into the green-blue light of spirits, it's possible that each monk gives Link their spiritual essence, their soul, before passing away. Which would be very fitting, considering that Link then delivers these spirits to Hylia herself at goddess statues. Once their tasks are completed, the ancient monks' souls are offered up to their goddess. It seems a different kind of spirit orb was used by the ancient Zonai tribe. At Thundra Plateau, a monk's voice asks Link to place the four spirits in their proper places, referring to the coloured orbs scattered around the area. If these are some sort of spirits, then it's likely that other Zonai orbs are too, like the ones found at the Seven Heroines. Olkin in Kakariko Village tells Link a story of how, long ago, a wise master simply known as the Swordsman was enshrined in the village, and that he offers a trial to teach mastery of offence and defence. This is referring to Monk Talonaeg's shrine just outside of the village, which teaches the basics of combat. But it's interesting that we learn a little bit about the history of a Sheikah monk before they sealed themselves in the shrine. Though the Sheikah found in Kakariko village return to a rural way of life, they still possess secrets and relics from their technologically advanced past, like the clothes the villagers wear, which use ancient technology to keep the wearer dry and even protect against lightning, though only Sheikah are permitted to wear them. Link is allowed to buy and wear Sheikah stealth gear though, which also uses ancient technology, this time to suppress noise. As the Kakariko Shika have lost their advanced technology, the stealth outfit has been passed down through the generations. Kado manages the cuckoos in Kakariko Village. He was married to Rola, but his obsession with the birds became too much for her. She gave him an ultimatum, her or the cuckoos. He chose the cuckoos. The mysterious energy harnessed by the Shika to power their machines apparently comes from deep below the ground. Pools of it are found in East Nakluda and Deep Akala, where the two tech labs were set up, and apparently deep below Hyrule Castle too. Pura's diary mentions that she installed her anti-aging rune onto a Sheikah slate that she made for herself. Perhaps that's what the mysterious box and glasses are that both Robbie and Pura wear, some sort of wearable Sheikah slate. Ancient arrows are powerful Sheikah blades crudely strapped to modern arrow shafts, and the descriptions for bundles of them note that they are repurposed ancient daggers. Creating a champion suggests that when Link activates the Sheikah Tower on the Great Plateau, it sends a signal to Hyrule Castle, which in turn acts as a central control unit and sends activation signals out to the shrines and remaining towers. The Royal Guard's sword is apparently a Sheikah-made replica of the Master Sword, 
forged with ancient technology to oppose the calamity. Its design is similar to the Blade of Evil's Bane, but a design flaw made it too brittle for prolonged combat. The Hateno Tech Lab is packed with ancient Sheikah relics, like half-assembled guardians, Sheikah slate pedestals, and even what looks like a miniature divine beast shaped like a manta ray hanging from the ceiling. On the night Hyrule fell, just as villagers burned in their homes, the four champions died trapped in their divine beasts, alone. And in the music for each of the Divine Beast's dungeons, we can hear what might have been the champion's desperate last messages. Each theme hides Morse code spelling out SOS, a call for help that went unanswered. The four Blight Ganons are phantoms of the Calamity. Small portions of his power used to slay the champions and take control of their machines. They take the form of malice fused with ancient technology, though curiously, each Blight wields a Sheikah version of the signature weapon of their respective champion. Fire Blight uses a greatsword like Daruk, Thunder Blight a sword and shield like Avosa, Water Blight a spear like Mipha, and Wind Blight a ranged weapon like Ravali. These ancient weapons were built by the Sheikah and then hijacked by Ganon, but they're far too large to have been intended for use by the champions, so their origins and purpose is a strange mystery. The Champions Ballad DLC ends with a final, happy memory of the champions, together with Zelda and Link, taking a group photo with the Sheikah Slate. We're never shown who was behind the camera here, but we can make a good guess, it's a woman who calls out, click, snap, just as she takes the photo, just like Pura does in the present. The Sheikah Slate is perhaps the single most important item in Breath of the Wild, but we don't actually know its name. Zelda's research notes mention that she and her team uncovered the slate, but that there was no mention of a name for the object in any records they had so far unearthed. The name Sheikah Slate was apparently coined by Pura, as it's literally a slate made by the Sheikah. Dark Beast Ganon could be harmed only by sacred weapons. The Bow of Light, the Amiibo Twilight Bow, Beams from the Master Sword, and Ancient Arrows, suggesting that ancient Sheikah technology could have divine origins. The Hyrule Compendium notes that most Sheikah weapons have a single bladed edge. This type of sword was unfamiliar to Hylian fighters, and so the Edge of Duality was designed by the Sheikah to be used by Hylian knights. Robbie's Ancient Oven, the device that makes ancient soldier gear and weapons, was originally a guidance stone. Robbie remodeled it and named it Cherry, after the first girl he ever loved, and with the help of his wife, Jerin, gave it the ability to speak. Cherry was able to speak just as well as a native Hylian, to answer questions and ask them as if she was a real person. Over time though, Jerin grew jealous of Robbie's relationship with Cherry, and so the machine was reverted back to a mechanical way of speaking. Sheikah architecture is covered in constellation patterns, and the room in which Link fights Calamity Ganon is apparently called the Astral Observatory, depicting Hyrule and its stars. Both ancient tech labs feature huge Sheikah telescopes. Clearly, the Sheikah were fascinated by the stars above. It's possible that they predicted the future through astrology, like the prophet Astor in Age of Calamity, who uses a Sheikah device which projects constellations to see the future. The Astral Observatory map of Hyrule depicts various landmarks, like Dueling Peaks, Death Mountain, and the Four Divine Beasts. But interestingly, we can also see the Lord of the Mountain over on Satori Mountain, which tells us two things. First, that the Lord of the Mountain was around over 10,000 years ago alongside the ancient Sheikah, and second, that the Sheikah considered it important enough to include in this room. Though the Lord of the Mountain is a sacred being, it could be dangerous to those who threaten its domain. Quince can be found at the Wetland Stable, who tells a story of how he took a nap while hunting on Satori Mountain, and later woke to find the spirits charging at him, and was saved only by the bravery of his dog, Sati. So there you are, a hundred little lore details about Breath of the Wild. It goes without saying that I'm so, so excited for Tears of the Kingdom, 
I hope it's just as rich with lore and story secrets as Breath of the Wild, and I hope we get to learn more about this new version of Hyrule and its history. This video took a lot of work to put together, so if you liked it, leave a like or subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.